So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the third session of the Older Adults and Opioids webinar series host, hosted by the Finger Lakes Geriatric Education Center. We are a HRSA-funded GWEP, Geriatric Workforce Enhancement Program, at the University of Rochester, and our co-sponsor for this series is the Western New York Rural Area Health Education Center. My name is Laura Robinson, and I am the program coordinator for the FLGEC. We are very glad that you could join us today. So just a few housekeeping items before we begin. The Zoom toolbar is located at the bottom of your screen. There are two important buttons there. The first is the participant button, which will show you the list of everyone in this meeting today. If you did not set up an account, or if you are using the phone to listen, you can hover over your name and number and rename yourself, and that'll make it easier for me to find you later and unmute you for questions and comments. And also for attendance purposes, we are federally funded, so the government likes to know that we're training actual real people, so that helps. And then the chat button will allow you to type hello, introduce yourself, and ask questions. So please take a moment to introduce yourself now with a name, job title, agency, and location in the chat feature. Thank you. Everyone will be muted throughout the presentation, and we will hold questions until the end of the presentation, but you may add questions into the chat box at any time. So now to introduce our sponsors, the FLGEC, or the Finger Lakes Geriatric Education Center, has been continuously funded by HRSA since 1999. We currently serve a 25-county area of the Finger Lakes region, but truly serve all of New York State through collaborations with many academic and community-based partners. Through educational initiatives targeting all healthcare providers and family caregivers, the goal of the FLGEC is to transform clinical training environments by integrating geriatrics into primary care delivery systems, resulting in an age-friendly health system, as well as dementia-friendly communities. And our co-sponsor is the Western New York Rural Area Health Education Center, or Rural AHEC, is, and they are a nonprofit organization headquartered in Warsaw, New York. And their mission is to improve health and healthcare through education. And counties in their catchment area include Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Chautauqua, Genesee, Livingston, Monroe, Ontario, Orleans, Steuben, Wayne, Wyoming, and Yates. The rural AHEC addresses the health needs of its communities by focusing on health, develop health workforce development, preceptor development in student housing, pipeline programming, and rural healthcare technology infrastructure development. So the REACH and the mission of the Rural AHEC made them a perfect partner to help us with this specific educational initiative. And again, we're glad you're all here today. And our fe featured speaker today is Dr. Paul Doherty. Dr. Doherty is the Chief of Chiropractic and the Chiropractic Residency Director for the Veterans Administration, or the VA, Finger Lakes Healthcare System. He has performed multiple randomized controlled trials evaluating the role of chiropractic care in the management of chronic lower back pain. He has been with the VA since 2005 and has been on the pain committee since 2006. He is currently the IRB chair for the Syracuse VA Medical Center and member of the research and development committee of the Syracuse VA Medical Center. His specific area of research is in the area of management of chronic lower back pain, utilizing a biopsychosocial approach. So I will now turn the program over to Dr. Doherty. Great, thank you. Can you can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the opportunity to present. We're gonna cover a fair amount of ground. Uh, but just an introduction, and I, I, if we could all talk, I would, I would ask you all how your clinics all look today. Um, my clinic looks pretty slow. Um, we, we've had a lot of cancellations with the, with the coronavirus, and we've had uh, a couple of big conferences uh, canceled, too. One of our big chiropractic research conferences just got canceled. But I saw a thing on Facebook that I just thought I'd share for all of you who are in academia or who go to conferences. They said, if your conference has been canceled, uh, just do your presentation in an empty room and pretend that you got the 8 a.m. slot uh, at a research conference. Um, and to make yourself feel even better afterwards, go buy a cheap beer and then drink it and throw $9 in the garbage. And so, uh, I figure that's, you know, that's probably as good a way to deal with all of this as, as any. Um, please ask questions uh, as, we, as we go along. Uh, I'm going to try and cover a fair amount of ground. Um, 
in, uh, in this topic of kind of management of chronic pain, specifically, in my case, chronic lower back pain, um, in older adults. Um, we did uh, a randomized control trial in 65 and over um, a few years back, and, and it was just a great opportunity. Um, and I'll talk about the role of chiropractic care a little bit, but kind of talk about uh, how my view of management of chronic low back pain has kind of evolved over the, over the years. So I feel like this first slide is the obligatory slide that everyone who presents on older adults needs to put up uh, as their first slide, that we know that the population is getting older, um, that most older adults experience some sort of pain, and that low back pain is uh, the uh, leading musculoskeletal pain in older adults. Uh, approximately 25% of older adults take some sort of analgesic pain medication, um, and a fair amount take uh, opioids. Um, and I would say in the VA, um, while we see that um, a fair amount now, it's becoming less prevalent. However, um, and during the discussion, we can talk about this a little bit, is that uh, we have a uh, few of our older adults who've been on opioids for 20 or 30 years. And so it's, you know, those are the ones that I think are, are a real challenge in this. Opioid misuse is, is an issue uh, in older adults. And um, really the push now, both from VA and non-VA standpoint and from NIH, um, is really to look, can we identify safe and effective non-pharmacologic management strategies for our older adults? Uh, I feel like this slide has been on other presentations, or at least it will be. This is kind of, uh, again, uh, from the CDC. I think the narrative that I, I heard the Monroe County um, health director uh, talk about this and it, it really made an impact on me. You know, in the 90s, we saw this, this idea that uh, pain is the fifth vital sign and that we needed to be addressing it. And there was a kind of a landmark paper that came out in the, I believe, late 90s or late 80s, early 90s on under management of chronic pain. And so there was this rise in the use of prescription opioids. Well, then around 2010, we saw this, this movement of, hey, we seem to have an opioid crisis. We need to, to do something about it. And we, we saw a, a steep decline in uh, prescription of opioids. And then around 2013, and this is a real nice slide to kind of uh, demonstrate this, we saw this real rise in the use of um, illicit drugs, specifically heroin and then heroin with fentanyl. And so kind of the take home story is we identified that there was a crisis identified, but then a strategy to what to do with these people seemed to be uh, kind of lagging behind. And so um, we know that in 2016, Dr. Or Dr. Obama, President Obama, uh, put in the CARA legislation and, and really emphasize this idea that we need to have prevention and treatment and recovery uh, to address this opioid epidemic. Kind of in response to that, and, and prior to that, the VA had started the Office of Patient-Centered Care and Cultural Transformation. Um, it was led by a woman named Tracy Gaudette, uh, who, if any of you ever have the opportunity, uh, really look her up on YouTube. She's a charismatic, uh, really great presenter. Um, and this idea of what we call whole health um, really uh, was uh, embraced in the VA. And, and a few years back, uh, President Trump uh, actually signed into legislation this kind of uh, movement uh, to to show that uh, whole health needs to be integrated into all facilities. And so there was some funding around the country for uh, the initial sites that did this. But basically the idea is, and it's, it's really not rocket science for anyone who's kind of been in healthcare for a while, it put the patient back in the center. We, we use what's called a whole health inventory, which basically identifies what's, what's important 
important to the patient? What is meaningful to you? What are your goals? How would your life look different if you didn't have this illness or this pain? Um, and then we work through the discussion of, you know, what are you doing as far as your energy and flexibility? Um, what are your physical and emotional surroundings? You know, when you're living in a toxic environment, it's much harder to, to heal. Do you have a work-life balance, uh, food and nutrition? Um, I'm going to touch on this later that we actually are doing a real unique, innovative pro program um, specifically around uh, food. Uh, how much sleep do you get? Sleep and pain are, are very much integrated, as is sleep and suicide. Um, so sleep is very important. Relationships kind of go to that physical and emotional surroundings. Your spiritual uh, condition, are you relaxing? And so the idea is to have a conversation around these things to empower the patient to take a role in their own care, to to really give them skills. And we'll, we'll kind of develop this a little bit more later. And then the VA has embraced complementary and integrative uh, medicine approaches um, and also the idea of prevention and treatment. And now there, there are, it's not that we're, we're not interested in conventional approaches, but we're, we're really looking to, are there ways to address people from a non-pharmacologic way? So the idea would be first to empower the patient to take care of themselves. Second would be the introduction of passive or professional care. And I would include chiropractic in that, um, in that idea of passive care, that the idea is to first empower patients, what can you do? Um, and then finally, where can the healthcare community or the VA community or, or just their community play a role? And I, I really am going to talk about, uh, when we talk about our, our kind of innovative programming, I'm going to talk about the role of socialization and the importance of social connectedness, and particularly in, in chronic disease populations or in, uh, in the elderly, we see that community and social involvement really is important. So this is kind of the, the model. This uh, gives a little bit more of an explanation that it's, it's personalized care, it's proactive care, and it's patient-driven. Now, what I will say is this all makes a really nice PowerPoint slide, and I, I hope that some of you are um, thinking, wow, that, that sounds great in theory, but how's it working? Well, I, I won't lie. The uptake is tough because what we're talking about is a, a paradigm shift um, from uh, really where the patient is a passive recipient in the healthcare system to empowering the patient to become an active participant um, and really that they are the ones who need to take control of their health care. And it, it is, it's a different model, particularly for our older adults who, who really have looked at the doctor as this expert who's going to tell me what I need to do, or he's going to, he or she is going to do something to me or for me or uh, along those lines so that I, they're going to make me better. This idea of making yourself better um, is, is a challenge. And so I always, I, I, I love this slide uh, because when I, I work with chiropractic students or when I, I talk to our residents or other uh, providers, this idea of this kind of rhetorical question, what's better, to create an environment where we provide all the care for the patient or a method where we engage and empower the patient to care for themselves? Well, you know, that's one of those rhetorical questions. Who's, who's gonna say uh, that they think we should create a passive dependent system? Yet, what I will say is that when we think about it, we, we really need to, to be a little introspective about this and recognize that the system really does not, is not designed to uh, empower patients to take care of themselves. For the provider, the financial incentives uh, are all for us to do something to the patient. But it's interesting, as, as I've worked in the VA uh, for a few years now, where we're not in a fee-for-service uh, model, um, 
I've, I've started to recognize that it's not just a financial incentive, that, that there's really an, an internal uh, incentive where we feel important when we do something to someone that they then are grateful for. Doc, that was incredible. You know, I can't believe how great it is that, you know, for us in chiropractic, you know, when you come in and you t our patients tend to leave feeling better than they came in and we do this passive thing to them that, that is palliative. And when we do that, that feeds our ego. And so we need to recognize that that the system disincentivizes patient empowerment, both from a provider standpoint, where we have financial incentives, but we also have uh, internal perspectives and incentives that, that make us want to have patients who need us. The system, um, you know, that uh, we, we tend to live in systems, even in VA, where we work on what's called Vera dollars, you know, providing more services shows that there's more need for more money. Um, and even patients that uh, we, we talk about, you know, there probably is no magic bullet for back pain, <clears throat> but a friend of mine, uh, Brian Westlake, he always says, the closest thing that comes to a magic bullet is exercise. And, and I would agree with him that exercise, I'd love to tell you that it's spinal manipulation or that it's chiropractic or that it's you know something that we do. I really do believe that movement and exercise is the closest thing. However, um, when, you, when you try and convince patients that going to the gym is actually better than coming in and getting your back rubbed and having manipulation, it's, it's a tougher sell uh, sometimes. And so I, I say this sounds like a rhetorical question, but I, I, I think that it's a much more complicated answer than, than we tend to give it credit for. And so how do we ex uh, kind of accomplish this goal? Well, we look at management strategies. And so we have this idea of patient-centered care. Um, where, you know, in, in the traditional uh, model, you know, the patient's role is passive, they're a recipient of treatment, they, uh, the provider dominates the decision making, it's disease centered, the provider does most of the talking and the patient complies. You know, in this patient-centered model, we, we empower the patient to take an active role. They're a partner uh, in their care. And again, what I'm going to say is when we recognize this and we talk about this model, I recognize that patient-centered care is not giving everyone everything they want. If we gave everyone everything they wanted, everyone would get a massage for the rest of one day a week for the rest of their life. Everybody would get that MRI they're wanting. Everybody would get all the procedures and, and all of these things that it, it really, we do recognize that this is a partnership, that it's a collaborative role, but that the provider is there to, to give evidence and to, to really give the patient options. We look at quality of life centered things that we, we ask the patient, you know, what's important to you? What would your life look like? How would your life be different? Um, if you didn't have this pain, if you could do other things that, the provider listening and, and I always talk about I'm going to talk about a small trial we did where we trained our chiropractors to um, deliver cognitive behavioral therapy for chronic pain and part of that is um, that when you ask a patient their goal um, and they say to be in less pain you say well that's not a real goal and then you explain the concept of smart goals and then you just shut up and listen for a patient to come up with that. And it, it really is hard as a provider to not give the patient options. Like when they just stare at you, you say, uh, so do you want to play with your grandkids? And then they say, yeah, 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 that's my, that's my goal. I want to play with my grandkids. But we, we need to let them set their own goal. This needs to be a, an introspective part of it. And then adherence. 
And so the bottom line is that we, we need to look at what the patient's priorities are, and then we need to use SMART goals. And it, this is the, sitting in the chair with the remote, uh, watching TV and, and drinking beer all day is, well, we have to kind of refocus them when that's their, their goal. And so uh, SMART goals, as, as most of you I'm sure have seen this slide a million times, they are specific, they are measurable, they are achievable, they're relevant, and they're time bound. And so, you know, in our 80 year olds, the I'm going to run a marathon really isn't probably fitting into this achievable goal. Um, but we, we kind of get people to think about what would my life look? How would my life look different? And, and then you, you get them to, to state, I want to be able to work in my garden for two hours a day. Uh, I want to be able to walk to the grocery store and back. I, you know, those kind of things. And then, then we set goals a little bit uh, at a time. And so what does the evidence say? Uh, we're talking about a biopsychosocial evidence-based model. Um, so in 2018, the Lancet published uh, the low back series, which was really kind of the, they called it the magnus opus of evidence for low back pain. Basically, it, and I don't think anyone on the call is going to be surprised at where the, where the evidence comes, but the guidelines recommend self-management, physical and psychological therapies, some forms of complementary medicine, less emphasis on pharmacological and surgical treatments, and overuse of imaging needs to stop. And I, I, I will say right here, uh, Deb Weiner, who's a very respected geriatrician, um, talks about this overuse of imaging and particularly its role in creating catastrophizing and fear avoidant behavior. And she, she, she has this great part in her presentation where she puts an MRI of an older adult up and you know, it has modic changes and degenerative changes throughout and, and stenosis. And, and she says, you know what this means about this patient? It means they're old. It means nothing else than that, that there's no correlation between the extent of degenerative changes on a film and the patient's level of disability. But what we do know from the evidence is that overuse of imaging, that uh, it actually can lead to catastrophizing behavior. It can lead to greater levels of pain and disability. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, but basically the idea is that you're, if we give people a reason to hurt, oftentimes they become self-fulfilling prophecies. And that's the whole basis of cognitive behavioral therapy is this idea of addressing those maladaptive behaviors. So what, is, what did they kind of say? Well, they said we need to have focused implementation of best practices. We need to have a redesign of clinical pathways. We need to integrate health and occupational care. And uh, we need to change the payment system and legislation. And we need to emphasize public health and prevention strategies. And I, I, I put this design down here, which you can't really read. and has absolutely nothing to do with back pain. But this is how I feel like everybody feels when you start to talk about pathways. They get muddled and they get confused and, and you know, nobody really knows how to, how to do it well. And so I think that simple answers uh, are, are probably best. So what does the evidence say? Well, for acute low back pain, basically the, uh, the best level of evidence is an advice to remain active. That, that the idea of you hurt so you need to stay home and not do anything is, is really, uh, it actually is detrimental to, to our patients. Education, uh, we, we have a small pilot study right now where we're combining chiropractic and um, patient education. Uh, I'm part of a very large uh, cooperative studies grant, which is at 16 locations where we're testing education as a first line treatment and online education module for uh, chronic low back pain. Um, and then superficial heat, which I have to say, uh, I, I really, it should not be a first line. And when I was in school, we learned ice and that heat was evil for acute uh, pain. But really, as we look at the evidence, heat does have a role. For chronic low back pain, again, advice to remain active stays there. 
education needs to be considered. And here's the interesting thing is that there, there is no one best education module. Uh, for those of you who kind of know this literature, um, Mosley and, and Butler have uh, explained pain and, and some of uh, those um, things, but I, there's not one education program that really has has been shown to be better than the other. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what needs to be as part of that. And then there's insufficient evidence for superficial heat in, in chronic low back pain. As far as therapies, um, we're going to see that really the, the evidence is for exercise. Uh, CBT certainly does uh, have a, a place to to play in that and, and for chronic low back pain, it really should be considered as a first line treatment. Uh, spinal manipulation uh, as a second line or adjunctive treatment, same for massage, same for acupuncture. Uh, there's insufficient evidence in acute low back pain for yoga, but yoga uh, does have a, a role in um, uh, chronic low back pain. Mindfulness-based stress reduction, which when you look at the, the data on this, mindfulness-based stress reduction tends to include something like an exercise program. Um, there was a real nice study by Dan Churkin that looked at this that showed that mindfulness-based stress reduction was a little bit superior to cognitive behavioral therapy and chronic low back pain. But you know, part of the theory is that there's a real structured exercise program with this, with CBT, um, at least in our study, it was a walking program, and so maybe not as uh, structured. And then interdisciplinary rehab, you know, these are these are second line. These tend to be very expensive. But really, as we look at what's most important is get them moving and address their maladaptive behaviors. And, and in our older adults, that really is important. And so this is, I'm just gonna talk very briefly about what we did in, in our study, which was we um, kind of looked at psychologically informed uh, chiropractic care. Um, and so we, we looked at, can we train uh, non-behavioral health providers to do CBT? And there is a little bit of evidence for PTs and nurses doing uh, CBT. Um, and so we, we actually work with Jen Murphy, who is the VA's lead in cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and we, we trained our chiropractors in, in doing this. And so we took patients who were at high risk for poor prognosis. For those of you who kind of know back pain literature, we used what's called the HEAL Start Back Index to, to uh, stratify those patients. Basically, this high risk for poor prognosis diagnosis and, and that questionnaire asks fear avoidance questions, it asks catastrophizing questions, anxiety, uh, those kinds of things, that those really are the things that put people at, at high risk for poor prognosis when it comes to uh, back pain. And then we did uh, the following sessions, we did kind of this treatment rationale, uh, we did the psychology, psychophysiology of pain, which is basically where you talk about this idea that uh, biopsychosocial model that pain is more complicated than just a, a, a pathoanatomic model. Just because you have a disc herniation or just because you have degenerative disc disease or just because you have stenosis doesn't mean that you uh, necessarily have to have pain and disability. Um, and so we really talk about this and and then kind of go through and give tools. So we send them home with a CD on breathing and relaxation and progressive muscle relaxation. I would say that I struggled the most with pacing, uh, which is you know that you don't have to stack that whole load of wood all at once, that you can kind of limit your activity. Cognitive restructuring also is, is very difficult. Uh, basically, it, when that person cuts you off in traffic, you know, rather than flipping them off and, and screaming at them, you, you think, oh, could that be an older adult who maybe has vision problems or uh, a young mom who's trying to take care of her children? That we, we need to reframe things that it's not all about us and that, that the world is not out to get us. Activity planning, how are you going to kind of plan your day so that you um, recognize your limitations, but also try and push yourself? That also is in problem solving. 
communication skills really has to do with communicating with your providers and others kind of about where you are uh, in this process. Um, uh, that large trial that I'm part of also is looking at CBT um, and they also are using a 10 session uh, module for that. So what we found was that we, you know, our N was very, very small. We found that adding CBT principles to a chiropractic encounter really only increased the time by 10 minutes um, and that patients were very satisfied. Now, that doesn't say that it, it's, that we um, have proven this concept, but this idea of psychologically informed treatment does seem to be getting uh, some trends. However, uh, just when you think you're really doing well, then we see that, you know, in at least back in 2016, um, you know, these uh, non-specific spinal pain, there were only small uh, pain and disability differences noted between psychological and behavioral informed treatments and combined interventions. However, two things with that. One, it was it's older and there have been some work since then. The other is that there are some inherent weaknesses in, in randomized control trials in the way we ask questions and in the way, particularly in pain trials, how we assess uh, responsiveness. So really, what is the future as we, we kind of easily can get discouraged in this? You know, what, what should we be doing uh, in our older adults who come in with chronic low back pain to to empower them and, and do well for them. Well, I, I wanna kind of go through this idea of first messages, empowering patients, patient-centered goals, outcome-driven care, and evidence-informed treatment modalities. And so this idea of first messages, we did, a, we did a small pilot study where we looked at if you uh, empower the patient first in a chiropractic clinic where they may have this um, kind of expectation that we're going to do things to them, um, you know, what if we, if, what if we completely empowered them and didn't, didn't do any passive treatment to them, but just gave them active care um, versus those that we, we did, you know, more passive care? Well, I, you know, we, we feel like there is a little bit of evidence to say that Reassurance of patients in those early phases really is helpful. And, and all of you who treat patients, have, I'm sure, have this experience that you, you have the patient who's come in, whose first provider just instilled within them that they are sick, that they have spinal stenosis, or that they have degenerative disc disease, which if I could take those words out of our vocabulary and talking with patients, I would because those are words that create catastrophizing. And this idea of early on talking to patients about, you know what, degenerative changes are just gray hair of the spine. It's really, it's really not something that's gonna kill you. You're, you're gonna do uh, okay. Um, you know, addressing those kind of uh, things early on and not creating maladaptive behaviors, I think is, is really very helpful. The second is patient empowerment, um, that we, we really get patients to identify their own goals um, and then really work with them through communication and mutual understanding. Looking at our role as health professionals, that it's not our job to cure you. Uh, it's our job to inform you. It's our job to give you tools to do. But in the end, you, you really are responsible um, for having a role in this and then giving them good information. Not everybody needs an MRI. Not Degenerative changes don't correlate with the extent of pain and disability. Those messages, what are you, what is the patient going to do for themselves? And, and I think in older adults, one of my experiences is that um, sometimes sending them to the gym is just not something they want to do. Particularly, I, I practiced in rural communities where these were, excuse me, old farmers who were just used to doing physical labor their whole life. And so, you know, in those, are there ways that we can get them out and get them active that doesn't medicalize their pain? Uh, sometimes when we prescribe things to people, 
it medicalizes it and, and makes it more of a challenge. And so, you know, that partnership between patients and professionals and supporting that, that self-management really is important and, and we really need to, to do that. The next is goal setting. And as we said, these need to be smart goals. These need to be, you know, the patient's goal can't be, doc, I want to have less pain. Because that we know that pain is, is very subjective and that it doesn't always correlate with actual disability. And so we really need to get them to talk about what functional goal they can achieve. Um, and that we need to educate professionals to have a better understanding of chronic pain and to, you know, get them to demedicalize that and facilitate the patient involvement in their, in their goal setting. And so this was a really neat study. It was done by the RAND Corporation, and I was actually uh, part of uh, this uh, study that and I won't go into too much detail just for time, but basically these were patients who were going to chiropractors and, and we see this in our own practice as we track outcomes in our chronic patients is that oftentimes the, the patient is not looking for a cure. They're looking for support. There, there really is this idea of that, <coughs> excuse me, checking in with their doctor and, and just, feeling like something is being done to them um, is helpful to them, but it doesn't necessarily change their pain or disability. And so we really need to look at how we can do things in cost-effective and efficient manners, telehealth and other things that empower patients, but are low cost and, and give patients more functional ability. Outcomes-driven care, and I, I purposely made this slide really busy and just ugly because it, really when you look at all of the different back pain inventories that you can use, it's, it's really exhausting. And, and what I can tell you is that I, we, we trialed um, stopping asking about pain in our clinic in a more formalized way in our outcome measures. We used only quality of life um, because we felt that if we could talk about ability and um, how this was impacting their life as a whole, we felt that that may um, have a better outcome. I, I, I will admit to you, it didn't work as well as we wanted to. And I, I, I hate when that happens. It was a great theory, uh, but really didn't didn't work. And so, you know, I, I will say that this is my, my thought at this point when it comes to patient outcome measures. Uh, complexity and compliance are inversely proportional. That the, the more complicated we make things, um, the, the less likely patients are to do them. And so um, we do need to assess patient responsiveness and care use some method, I would say really using some sort of functional method is, is better. You know, what can you do? How are you doing toward achieving your goals? But try not to make it complicated. And so evidence influence care, as we, we all know, and we've all seen this slide a million times, it, it does have research, but it also includes patient preferences and, and the clinical circumstances, and then you as the provider. And so in chiropractic, we, I was part of this uh, project where we were uh, working on a best practices document. We published it in, in 2017. Basically, what I will tell you is that, um, you know, our trial was considered a high quality randomized control trial. Uh, it was a sham controlled trial. And what we found was that pain didn't really change whether we did sham or manipulation. But disability was a little bit better in those patients who, who underwent uh, manipulation. There, there also are, uh, you know, a low quality and a medium quality randomized control trial. Two cohort studies, you know, showed that chiropractic care resulted in, these were Medicare database studies, uh, decrease and decline in lower body function and self-rated health. Um, I will say um, that one of the things that we, we need to consider in this is chiropractic, older adults who use chiropractic, 
may be people who just are more health conscious to begin with. And, and so I think we need to consider those things. And then uh, balance and false, not really a whole lot of evidence. The other thing is that it's safe. Uh, and so, you know, we uh, I published a couple of studies specifically looking at safety in spinal manipulation and other studies have, have shown that also. Um, we currently have a study uh, that we're doing at the Syracuse VA uh, where we're doing manual therapy in uh, older adults with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and showing improvements in, in lung function. And so there, there really is a role not just for musculoskeletal pain for chiropractic specifically, um, but we do need to recognize that, it, you know, you need to find a provider who, who understands what it is to deal with older adults and uh, is really going to, you know, use caution. And so what about other approaches? And, and I think that for me, what's been uh, frustrating over the past uh, 30 years of practice and, and really 15 years of, of doing research um, is that everything works some of the time, nothing works all of the time, and we really don't know who to do what and when. And so, I think that, you know, we need to also be thinking about um, what are some novel ways that we can be treating uh, patients. And so um, one of the things that, that came up, and for anyone who knows me as a person, I, I probably should have put this in my bio, Laura, is that I, I also am a farmer. Um, and that uh, farming really is my, my passion. We, we grow a lot of our own food. And so, you know, the idea of using functional activities such as farming really um, became very, I'll tell you the story. But my wife and I were rolling round bales, for those of you who know what those are, uh, up on a trailer one day. And she said, you know what, people would pay for this. That we'll call it farm fit. And so this idea of using functional activities of farming to treat our veterans um, kind of came in. And so we, we came up with this concept of therapeutic horticulture, um, which basically is this idea of using the functional activity of growing uh, food, uh, consuming healthy food, uh, to use as a method of addressing um, fear avoidant behaviors, uh, as well as the catastrophizing of, I couldn't possibly, you know, weed a row of carrots because my back hurts too much. Well, people found that they could do those activities. And so what we did was we, we did a 10-week program that had a didactic component, which was basically learning about um, different aspects of growing food. And then we, we went out in the garden and we actually did uh, activities. And then we, we ate lunch together. We cooked and ate lunch together from food that we had um, harvested out of the garden. And one of the things that, that I will say about this, and, and this was one of our gray older adults, and actually both of these are over 60, um, they, that, one of the things that we found was we said, are you sore the night that you are there? They'd say, yeah, but it's a good sore. Do you sleep better the night you're, you participate in the program? Yeah, I sleep a lot better. And that, you know, this idea of can they do things? The, but if I'm very honest, and we just did a white paper conference and really looked at our data over the last four years of, of doing this project, what I will tell you is that the therapeutic value may have as much to do with socialization and feeling a part of a community, the, the removal of social isolation uh, in these veterans and older adults really does play a big role in this. And so, you know, this idea of using the functional activity of then uh, cooking together, eating together, and then sending people home with food. I would love to tell you that this resulted in uh, lots of people uh, who really lowered their uh, pain and disability and now are, are only going to farmers markets. But what I will say is, as we looked at our data and we've looked at pain, disability, self-efficacy, and quality of life, 
as well as uh, we do observations and we do a qualitative uh, component. What I can say is that self-efficacy did seem to move some, uh, and we feel like that that is uh, a positive thing. Uh, quality of life didn't move a huge amount, but recognize that our N is pretty small. But our qualitative data really showed that, that there's this idea that they were highly satisfied with it, um, that they um, learned new skills, that they um, liked being in a mixed gender uh, activity, um, that they, they really wanted to do more. And so what we found was uh, that we did expand the program. And, and right now we currently have a very large grant through the Office of Rural Health uh, that we've expanded the program to two different cohorts. Um, and we are partnering with Cornell uh, and working on workshops and, and other areas. And so we really are uh, excited about uh, what we're doing. And so kind of the bottom line, I think from a biopsychosocial model of uh, taking care of our, our older adults is, um, it sounds very simple, but keep moving. That you know, get them to, to get away from the, I'm old, I'm sick, I, I can't do anymore, um, to, yeah, you can, and, and find what's valuable and important to them uh, to, to keep them engaged. Avoid narcotic pain medication and start with therapies uh, that engage the patient that are not passive, really demedicalize uh, that. Now, you know, uh, again, I work in the VA and I, I always uh, want to recognize that there are things that are easier in the VA to make work than maybe in the private sector. Um, but I, I think that these principles of empowering people, getting them moving, demedicalizing, uh, I think are the, the most important. So uh, I hope I've left uh, time for questions and I hope you have some questions. Paul, that was great. Thank you so much. So if anyone um, listening has any questions, please use the chat box to type them in. I know I had two questions, so I'll kind of fill the space while we're waiting for people to type. But um, one of your slides mentioned a sham. I was wondering if that was the same as placebo effect in your study. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's a, a great question. Yes. Uh, so the sham treatment in this study uh, was uh, detuned ultrasound. So we basically uh, bought an expensive ultrasound machine that had lots of bells and whistles and we rubbed uh, ultrasound gel on people's backs for 11 minutes uh, with the machine off. Uh, Long time. <laughs> and what I will say is that's absolutely, the idea of nonspecific therapeutic effects really is powerful. I was just this morning reading a, a paper on, you know, the myth of placebo. The that really uh, the encounter itself, the doctor-patient interaction, the, the feeling of, uh, of um, somebody listening to me and doing something to me uh, actually plays a huge role. Okay. So I had a second question that goes way back to the beginning of your presentation where you talked about having active and empowered patients. So I couldn't help think about um, the role of health literacy and does your team measure health literacy at all? Do you look at health literacy? Is it a factor? Are you helping people improve health literacy? So anything that you could say about that? Yeah, it's a, again, a great question. And some of the, you know, the idea behind the pain education modules um, really is that the, this idea of, um, helping patients understand more about what, what is wrong and, and how can I understand what these doctors are saying to me? And, you know, when I hear words like degenerative and disease, you know, what does that matter? So I would say, no, not in a formal health literacy way, but certainly in a, in, in a patient education module. Yes. Okay. Because I, I can't help but think, I, I was talking to some of, of the older individuals in my church a couple of weeks ago about 
how medical care has changed over the decades and what medical care looked like when they were children. And it was, you know, the doctor came to visit you at home. You didn't seek out medical help and you just continued on until, you know, it, the doctor either came around or you sought out the doctor. So is there any, I don't know, what do you think about that statement, I guess, in terms of, of treating our older adults and their usage of the health system? Yeah, I, I, again, I think that they, many of them have that, that model of, you know, the doctor knows best. And so whatever he or she says is, is what, um, I need to, I need to do. And so, um, yeah, I think in older adults that it, it is a challenge and, um, for many of them, they're, they're set in their ways and that's where that first message is really does matter that I think when people get in their mind that they're sick and that there's nothing that can be done for them. You know, I have arthritis and I'm always going to have arthritis. And so, you know, nothing you do is going to change that doc. That's a, that's a tough mindset to, to get over. Agreed. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions coming in. So I was either really horrible or just <laughs> incredibly brilliant. And there's just, I've answered every question that there is about this. I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm trying to stall and see if folks have something they could uh, type in. I guess I'll say going once, going twice, sold. We did end a little overtime last webinar, so maybe it's fitting that we end a little early this time to make up for it. All right. Well, thank you very much for the opportunity to present. And um, you're very welcome. And I did get a comment that it was very good that you're talking about patient centered care. So thank you, Michelle, for that comment. All right. Well, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We will. We did record this. We will post it on YouTube at a later date. And our next webinar is not until May. So I hope to see you all in May. Have a great day. And thank you again, Paul. Yep. Have a great day. Bye. You too.